Our scripture reading this morning is from the Old Testament Psalm number 132. It's titled A Pilgrimage Song, and it goes like this. Lord, remember David, all the ways he suffered and how he swore to the Lord, how he promised the strong one of Jacob, I won't enter my house, won't get into my bed, I won't let my eyes close, won't let my eyelids sleep until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the strong one of Jacob. Yes, we heard about it in Ephratah, and we found it in the fields of Ja'ar. Let's enter God's dwelling place. Let's worship at the place God rests his feet. Get up, Lord, go to your residence, you and your powerful covenant chest. Let your priests be dressed in righteousness. Let your faithful shout with joy. And for the sake of your servant David, do not reject your anointed one. The Lord swore to David a true promise that God won't take back. I will put one of your children on your throne, and if your children keep my covenant and the laws that I will teach them, then their children too will rule on your throne forever. Because the Lord chose Zion, he wanted it for his home. This is my residence forever. I will live here because I wanted it for myself. I will most certainly bless its food supply. I will fill its needy full of food. I will dress its priests in salvation, and its faithful will shout out loud with joy. It is there that I will make David's strength thrive. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed one there. I will dress his enemies in shame, but the crown he wears will shine. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today is Christ the King Sunday. It's the end of the year. Woohoo! The end of the Christian year, it's the last Sunday, and we celebrate that this year is over. Yay! It's so yet another year where we want to celebrate the year being over, <laughs> right? Maybe Advent will bring a new kind of year. How about? And I read a lot of commentaries on the scriptures this morning. I read a lot of what people thought, and almost every commentary said the same thing, which is this. Americans don't like the idea of a king, and so we don't like Christ the King Sunday. And the idea being that because we rejected a king in the revolution all those many years ago, that we don't understand what it means to have a good king. And we don't like to think about Christ being king. We much prefer Christ the shepherd, or Christ the little baby in the manger, or Christ in all the other forms that we have a really hard time with the idea of Christ the King. And I don't know that that's necessarily true. See, the idea is that we don't like this idea of the strong man, like the one person who's in charge, who just takes charge of things. The one person who can tell us what to do, who can be righteous in any given situation. I don't know that that's true, that we don't like that. I mean, if anything else, you can look at the movies, right? Look at the box office last weekend and tell me what movies were in the top of the box office. They were superheroes and James Bond. Now tell me that those two aren't examples of righteous people, well, <laughs> but at least strong people, strong men who can take over and tell us what to do and make the evil guys go away, right? Now, James Bond may be a little morally questionable in his tactics, but at the very least, he makes the bad people go away and wins the day for good and righteousness, right? We love the idea of one person who can take over the world and tell us what to do and make everything right again, because it makes us feel good, it makes us feel like somebody's in charge, somebody, somebody's in charge at last. And we want to believe that there are good people that there are good people who can handle unlimited power, can make the world right again. This isn't a new phenomenon. Some of you have heard about my obsession with history podcasts lately, but there's a really good one called The History of Rome, and it's like 10 years of going through the history of Rome piece by piece. And last week's episode was about the dictator, the invention of the dictator. This is fascinating to me, so hold on. <laughs> the dictator was a guy who was, invent who was created by Rome to have absolute power, and he could do whatever he wanted, whatever he wanted, anything at all. 
And originally, these dictators were only called up in times of chaos, the idea being that people couldn't be trusted to make decisions as a group when there were bad things happening. And so they ditched this idea of Roman democracy every once in a while when there was a war going on or whatever. And they would elect this one guy, the dictator, who had unlimited power. What's really cool is that this one guy with the unlimited power, the, one of the first ones, his name was Cincinnatus, the name of Cincinnati, right? And he's famous because, you know what he did? He gave up power. He had unlimited authority, unlimited authority to do whatever he wanted. And eventually he said, you know what? I think I want to be a farmer. And they went back to democracy again. So it's not a new phenomenon. We love the idea of this person who can come in and save us from whatever chaos is going on in the world. And maybe it's not, you know, like a strong man in that way, but we, we worship celebrities in the same way. Or an influencer who can tell us, you know, if we just put the right highlighter on, we could just make our cheekbones stand out a little bit more, then the chaos in your life will go away. Or if you're me and you follow organizational influencers, because if I just buy the right binder, right? Or I figure out the right way to um, organize my notebook, you know, write things down in the right way, or if I just figure it out, then all the things are gonna be fine. We love this idea that there's something strong out there that can do it. Now, Psalm 132 is this story of David. It's the end of David's life. And David um, was the James Bond of kings. You know, not a good guy. Not somebody we want to be friends with. He made some bad choices, as my kids would say. If my kids read David's life, they would run up to me and say, Mommy, Mommy, he's making bad choices, right? <laughs> And this is an attempt in Psalm 132 to sort of remake David's image. To sort of say, well, David, we know you're about to die, so why don't we say some nice things about you? He was kind of weak, personally. He was morally questionable. And he somewhat believed his own hype. And so in this psalm, they try to lift him up and re remake his personality a little bit. Now, David, you have unlimited power, and you're supposed to make things better for us, and we're going to list all of the ways that you made things better for us, but it's not a very good list. He sort of almost made the temple, kind of. The only thing he did that was good was follow God. David's only accomplishment was to fear God, was to listen to God, to understand that while he had unlimited power, he wasn't God. And yet he failed at everything else that makes you a good king. I mean, at the very least, a good king should set up their kingdom to continue being a kingdom after a while, right? Like a good leader makes it so that the next leader is going to succeed. That's a good, a good marker for, the, for a leader. But if you read the rest of the Old Testament, you know super quick the kingdom's about to fall and they're all going to be taken off to Babylon, right? David failed at being a leader in almost every single way. So why did he get to continue being king? Because the one thing he did, the one thing he was good at, the one thing that made him strong was following God, was fearing God. God tells David that you will be king because I will it to be so. As long as the kings are just, God says, as long as the kings are good, as long as you follow God and fear God, then you will continue to be king and your son will be king and your son's son will be king. What the people learn is that if we depend on a human king, going to fail. They're always going to let you down because people are people. All people are people. Every person is a people. And that means that you are sinful and you make bad choices. I make bad choices. All of us, every single one of us. We're time limited. We're physically limited. And we only know what we know. And so we are never going to be a good king. And I don't know who your strong man is in your life. Maybe it's you. Maybe you feel like you need to be the king in your life. 
But none of us, none of us are going to be a good king. David's not unique. God's sovereignty is the truth, the one truth that never fails, never goes away, never ends, is always right. God is always faithful. And as long as we remember that we don't have to be the king of our own lives, as long as we remember that we don't need somebody else to be the king of our life, as long as we remember that humans are humans and people are people, and that means that we're going to sin sometimes, then we can remember that God is none of those things. God is always faithful. God is always righteous. God is always just. God is eternal. And God is always looking out for your best interest. What God teaches us is that people who are strong are generous of spirit. That true strength means being vulnerable, acknowledging our limitations. True strength means that we know that we are sinful and we don't get to be in charge of our own lives and that we have to rely upon God's righteousness and strength. And so we can choose to be generous of spirit and we can choose to let God be in control and we can choose to remember that we are not kings. And neither are you. And we can rely on God who is always, always, always faithful. And so next week when we come back and it's Advent and we celebrate the coming of a king, we can do that with joy and with hope and with humility and generosity. Generosity to one another and generosity to ourselves. Because Christ is king. Hallelujah. Amen.